Um, oh, uh, is my screen just still shown there, or has that disappeared? Because it does something weird on my computer. Uh, no, we can see. It might be because I started the recording. Possibly. Yeah, I think that was it. <laughs> okay, no worries. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to tell you about Git. Uh, basically, um, Git attempts to try and sort of solve this problem, um, which I'm sure most people have had at some point in their lives, um, which is you end up with document one, you get some feedback on it, you have document version two, then it goes back and forth a few more times, you get version six, seven, eight, nine, ten with corrections, um, and uh, it gets very messy. And, you know, it's, it's not really a great way of organizing you know, your documents or your code. Um, and uh, Git is basically um, a piece of software that helps us to create files, update them, and then let us go back to older versions. Um, for academia, that's basically most useful for document preparation. So writing papers, theses, reports, websites, uh, or in writing code. Um, so, you know, and storing things like input files that are associated with that. Um, so uh, Git is a, one of a long history of things called version control systems. It's probably the most popular one that's around. It allows you to have unlimited undo on your, uh, on your code or your documents. Um, it allows lots of people to work on the same thing. So in my last job um, in industry, we had about 30 people working on one software project, uh, all powered by Git, basically. Um, so it's very powerful. Um, it has a bit of a reputation of being quite difficult to learn um, and that's not an unjustified uh, uh, you know criticism of it it's not the most straightforward thing in the world but um, basically uh, I think any any tool that allows you to collaborate like this has to have some complications um, but uh, hopefully we can take you through sort of like the basics of it um, and get you to a point where you know you can um, find it useful at least in your own work um, so Prerequisites, you should all have set up Git on your computer. Um, if you haven't, here's the instructions for how to do it very quickly. Um, the other thing you need to do is quickly create an account on github.com if you haven't already. Um, if you have done those things, can you give me a thumbs up on uh, Zoom? Um, if not, I'll uh, give you a minute in case anyone's not done any of those things. people maybe not not done that um i'll just leave these up for a second um basically uh, there's lots and lots of different ways to use git um we're going to teach you the command line version of it um that is basically the way that git was you know designed and developed and intended to be used but um there are tools that can sit on top of that um which offer you like a, a graphical user interface a gui um, you may find that once you've got used to the idea of Git, using one of those is more straightforward for day-to-day -day work. Um, but in general, I'd recommend that you use the command line to learn Git. And then once you know how to use it, the, the, the concepts are there and you can transfer that to whatever software that basically just sits on top of the command line. Um, we're we're going to be following this material from Software Carpentry um, loosely with some additions and things taken out. Um, so if you want to refer back to that um, later, then that's a good place to look for um, the material that we've, uh, we're have we going to do today. Um, okay, so hopefully everyone's got that done. Um, if not, then uh, please let Keris or uh, Debbie know in the chat and then um, someone can help you. Uh, oh, here's some, uh, here are some of the GUI options if you do want to try those later. Source tree, I don't like it very much, but some people like it. Um, Git Kraken and GitHub Desktop are quite popular. If you use a text editor for writing your code, um, these ones all have got Git functionality built into them. So you can sort of do your Git where you're actually writing uh, your documents or your code. Um, that's quite useful. Personally, I use VS Code a lot. Um, I find it really helpful. Um, but, you know, that's, that's, that's just one of many. Um, as I said before, they're all just wrappers over what we're going to learn today in the command line. But um, if you, so really it's just the concepts you need to understand. Um, once you know the concepts, it's very easy to switch. Um, okay. Uh, this is going to be practical. So we want to leave you some experience of typing out commands and getting a feel for how it works. 
So what I'm going to do is be typing things into a terminal. Um, you're sort of expected to have some familiarity with the Linux shell. Hopefully you've been on a introduction to Linux course or the software carpentry flash course already. Um, please, if you're not sure about something, either unmute yourself and ask a question and interrupt me or type it in the chat. I've got a chat window open on my other monitor, so I should be able to see the questions as well. If you find it confusing, it's probably confusing for other people. So um, yeah, you know, uh, we can uh, try and go over anything that's not so clear. Uh, I've got a couple of other things that you need to do before we sort of really start. Um, these commands you should do basically in your um, in your terminal. Um, so I'll just uh, open up mine and do them here, but uh, everyone really should do these um, because they basically give everybody a common ground of what their setup is. Um, so one of them is just setting your name for Git, um, because if you don't do that, it doesn't know who you are. Um, this is like a global setting uh, for Git. Uh, basically, um, once we have done that, uh, all of your um, files and things will be labeled with your name, which is really like an important thing to do. Sorry, I'm not sure. Uh, let me just, uh, this is the first time I've ever done this with, with Zoom, so uh, it's a learning experience for everyone here, I think. <laughs> um, so I, you just basically need to type these commands out. Um, obviously don't put my name in there, uh, put your, your name in there. Uh, so, If you haven't already, uh, to open um, get on the, the terminal on Windows, you should uh, go to start and type git bash and then open that and you should see what I've got as long as you've installed it previously. Um, on Macs, um, you can open uh, the applications folder and you should have something called terminal and that will give you the same thing and if you're on Linux, uh, it's the same kind of thing. It depends on which Linux distribution you're using, but you should have a terminal available. Um, so you, once you sort of type that command out, and then you should move on and do all the others. Um, this basically sets your Git settings across your whole computer. Um, The second one here, this is quite important. Um, in different computer operating systems, we have uh, different ways of encoding that a new line exists in your file. Um, on Windows, uh, it marks this with two characters, and on Linux, it marks it with one character, this backslash n and backslash r backslash n. Um, this goes back to, back to the days of typewriters when you uh, had a, um, a separate uh, command for basically uh, going scrolling down and moving back to the start of the line. Um, but basically it's just a weird legacy thing that you don't really need to know about other than it's a good idea to type these commands. Uh, username and email is supposed to be the same as created in GitHub. Um, it's not your username, it's, it's your actual name um, here. So that's fine. Um, it doesn't really matter about your email, but yeah, I, I've stuck mine as the same as what my GitHub one is. Um, so because I'm on Windows anyway, I'm going to use this command. Uh, if you're on Mac or Linux, you should use this command. Um, and that means that it gets sort of configured appropriately for your operating system. And if you um, go to a new computer, you should always sort of uh, do this um, before you start cloning things or uh, using Git. Um, it's really, really important. Um, the last one, um, I'm going to use nano as a text editor throughout this, this tutorial. Um, nano is the command line text editor. It's probably the most simple command line e editor, um, but you can use others. If you're used to using Vim already, then you don't need to do anything because uh, Git defaults using Vim. Um, Vim is kind of scary for new people to command line tools, so I wouldn't recommend it as a, as a, new, um, a new starter, really. Uh, to using Git, um, but Nano is much more simple and I can 
talk you through the commands um, as, as I'm doing them to laser. So uh, I'm also going to set my uh, text editor to nano. Okay. Can you give me a thumbs up if you've all done that? In that case, uh, I shall move on. Um, so, okay, I'm going to work in a folder on my desktop um, so that I can also open it up uh, somewhat, you know, in, in Windows Explorer. Um, so, what I'm going to do first is change directory into my desktop. Uh, you should all do the same, but unless you really want to put your, your Git stuff somewhere else. Um, if you're not familiar with the, the uh, command line, cd means change directory, ls means list files. Um, I'm going to create a folder here called uh, uh, software carpentry tutorial. Uh, if you're having trouble with hearing, hmm, I don't know what the solution is really. Um, Debbie, can you hear me okay? I can, he sort of occasionally goes quieter. Okay, if I, uh, if you can't hear me, please say in the chat and I'll try and repeat myself. Um, apologies for that. I don't really know what the problem is. Um, so I'm going to create a folder called swc-tutorial-git. Um, and then I'm going to change directory into that folder. So this is sort of the starting point I'm going to work from. Um, hopefully you've all got something similar. Um, what I want to do is create what's called a Git repository. A repository in Git terms is sort of like a, a backup of all your changes to your file. Um, what I'm going to do is type git init. This tells uh, Git I want to create a repository in this folder. Um, and what you see is that it says in, initialize empty git repository in uh, C users pepper R desktop, you know, that folder. Um, if I type ls now, you'll see that there's nothing there. Um, but if I type ls dash al, you can see that there's a, a folder with a dot in front of it. Um, in bash, a dot means it's a hidden folder. Um, so in this folder is sort of like a basically get database for all the files that we're going to create and track the changes to over time. Um, if I look inside it, you'll see there's quite a few different things. Generally, you don't need to care about any of this. Um, the only thing I will say is that the one that's called config is sometimes quite useful to look in, but um, we're not going to do that now. Um, so basically, uh, the next step for what we're going to do is create a file. Um, so I'm going to create a file called test.txt with nano. Um, if you've not used nano before, um, it's basically a standard text editor. If I start typing things, I can put hello, my name is Ryan. Um, if I want to save, you can see that on here, there's all these um, things with the uh, symbols called but basically this 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 arrow here mean pointing up this means command uh, so control so if i press control on my keyboard and o uh it will write out which means save the file so if i uh press con control o then it says file name to write test.txt if i now press enter uh then it will save save that file um okay and if i want to press if 
I press uh, Control and X, then it will exit the file. Um, so once I do that, and then if I type ls, I can see that I've now got a, a file inside my directory called test.txt. Um, just to show you if you're on Windows, I can type explorer and then dot here, and it will open that folder for me. Um, you know, I can open that in Notepad or whatever you know thing you want to open it with um, here. That sometimes quite useful, I find. Um, you know, if you're jumping around between the command lines, sometimes you want to go and see your directory in Windows Explorer. Um, if you're on Mac, you can type open space dot. Um, on Linux, it really depends what Linux you're using, so I can't really give you a general answer, but um, that's quite a useful, useful thing to know. Um, from here, uh, we now want to sort of create what we call a commit. A commit is like a record of that file at a particular moment in time. Um, so uh, if you think about, you know, you're working on your thesis, you might want to save your changes for the day, or, uh, you know, you've written a bit of your chapter or edited something. Um, what you want to do is create a record of it so that if you, I don't know, your computer dies, you can go back to it at a later date um, and uh, recover that, that set of changes. So there's sort of two things we need to do to do this. Um, Git has what's called like a staging area. The staging area is sort of where you put files that you're preparing to commit. So you can see your staging area if you type git status. Uh, no, we don't need to follow those general steps every time we start Git, only the first time you set it up on your machine. Um, git init is only every time you want to create a new repository. Um, but but the other things I'm showing you, you'll, you know, you'll do it every time. Basically. Um, so if I type git status, um, I can see that it says I'm on branch master. You don't need to worry about that too much yet, but I'll explain it later. It says no commits yet. That means that so far I've not created any records of files. Um, and I've got this bit here that says untracked files. That means that at the moment, git can see that there's a file there, but it isn't recording any history about that file. So what we need to do first to make it sort of look at this file is to type git add test.txt. Um, now if I type git status again, what you'll see is that it's now moved. Um, I now see changes to be committed. That means that um, if I now create a commit, it will create a record of test.txt. Um, in, in what's called a commit. Um, so the way that you create a commit is to go git commit. Um, you type dash m and then what we do here is create like a descriptive message recording what the changes are. Um, it's really good practice to be as descriptive as possible. So uh, often you'll see on people's code that they'll do things like uh, write bug fixes. That's not really very helpful to anybody because if someone needs to go back and look at when a problem was introduced, um, it doesn't say what the person did. So um, it can be very difficult to try and uh, work out what happened if you're looking at hundreds and hundreds of commits. Um, so what, what I would tend to do here is write something like created file test.txt. Um, and that's it. So now I've created a log basically of that file um, that's stored inside Git's folder. If I type ls, I've still got the current version of it. Um, and if I type git log, I can see a record of all of the commits that exist. So here you've got um, a few different things. This really long string here uh, is called a hash. And this basically uni uniquely identifies the set of changes that we've made. Um, and you'll often use these for various things. You can see that this is uh, a longer version of what we had here when we created the commit. Um, this short version basically can be used to refer to this. Often people will just type out the short version instead of the long one, um, just because it's a lot quicker. Um, but this is sort of like the, the true identifier for the commit. Um, you can see that the author is here, which is me. You can see when I created it and you can see what I did 
in my method. Um, so what I'm going to do now is just create another commit. So what I will do first is change the file. Um, I'm going to add another line. I'm going to save it by pressing Control O and then Enter, uh, and then I'll quit by pressing Control and X. Now, if I run Git status, you'll see it's slightly different to last time because instead of saying it wasn't tracking it, now you can see that it says it's been modified. Um, what I can do here is type Git diff. This shows me what's changed since the previous commit. So this is really meant to be like machine readable. Um, it's not the most easy to look at thing, but basically what it's saying is um, it's add, you see these pluses here in the green, it's in green. Um, that means I have added some lines basically at the bottom of the file. Um, what Git actually does is it doesn't record, you know, 10 full versions of the file, what it does is record only the changes between them. Um, it does that because it's more like space efficient. So, you know, if you've got a 100,000 line file and uh, you only change one line, it means it doesn't store 200,000 lines, it only stores 100,000 and, 100, and one lines uh, of changes. Um, so it's quite like compact and uh, almost compressed, I suppose uh, you'd say. Um, so anyway, I run git status, there's some changes. I still need to do git add um, to add it to the staging area. Say I, I want to commit this file when I create a commit. Um, and I'm going to add another commit. So I'll type git commit dash m uh, added my job to test.txt. Okay. So now if I run git log, I will have two commits. The, this is my original one, and this is my second one. So you can see it's in reverse chronological order here. Um, so if I type ls now, uh, I can see only that one version of file. Okay, yeah. Um, so Sally has asked, uh, can you tell me what dash M means? That just means commit message. So um, I can show you what happens if I don't type that. So um, if I type test, if I try and edit test.txt a third time, and I'll add a third line here. Uh, I'll save the file. Uh, if I just type git commit, uh, oh, I didn't add it. So I need to type git add test.txt. If I just type git commit without the dash m or the message, it will open up my text editor and it says, please enter your commit message for your changes. Line starting with the hash will be ignored and an empty message supports the commit. So if I put now here, um, added my age to test.txt and save the file and then quit. That's created a commit. Um, so the, the dash M is just a, a flag basically that says, I want to, to create a commit uh, with this message. It's, it's a convenient way of avoiding having to open up your editor and um, you know, uh, do it there. Um, so now we've got a few different versions of the file. Um, I want to go back, for example, and say, say I've made a mistake. I've, uh, I didn't want to add this change yet for some reason. So I want this version to be the version that I'm using. Um, I can do a few different things to show you the differences. Um, in Git, there's a concept of the head. You can see that it says head here. The head is sort of like the latest change. Um, 
and we can we can go back in time in git commits using um things relative to the head so um in a way like you think about today you can think about yesterday is today minus one you could think about this commit as head minus one um so if i want to show the change between where i am right now and the last commit i can type uh yeah, yeah. Head tilde one, so the tilde here is just meaning minus, and then I can say test.txt, and it will show me the change between what I have now and what my last commit was. So you can see here's those two lines. Um, so that's really useful because you know you can see you can, you can change back to what was on there in the previous date or a different time. Um, more useful is being able to sort of permanently do that. Um, so uh, it's obviously very easy for me to go back one commit while I, uh, you know, I'm looking at that today. But after a lot of time, I might have 100 commits. And so I don't want to be typing head tilde 100. Um, you know, I might get it wrong by one. I want to uniquely identify that commit. So what I might do is instead of um, doing head tilde one, if I look at git log, we have that really long hash here. I'm just going to copy a few digits of that. Um, and if I do this again, instead of putting head tilde one there, I put a few of those digits there. I get exactly the same result. Um, that's really useful because your yeah your commits aren't always you know straightforward um, you know uh, series of things. They might be very complicated. Um, they might uh, have a long history. And so using that 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 unique identifier that you see here, the commit hash, um, is a really useful uh, thing to do. So say that I've decided after looking at this diff that I want to keep that version of a file. Um, what I can do is check out uh, that version of the file. Checking out is sort of saying, take this copy and apply it to what I have here. So if I type git check out and then those numbers again, so 2AE637 and then put the file name. And then I can type ls and I can see that I've got test.txt. If I print out test.txt, I can do that conveniently just by typing cat and then the file name. You can see that the line that I'd added, I am 28 years old, has now disappeared. Um, so I have that version from previously. Um, so this is sort of what I mean when I say that git is unlimited undo. As long as you commit your stuff fairly frequently, you can always go back and recover an old version um, of the file. If I type git status now, uh, you can see that it shows as a change that needs to be committed. Uh, Lee has asked how to get the number of AE234E0. So if I type git log, you can see all of my commits. Look. So I was on this one. This was my top one here. Now I wanted to go back to the previous one. This, this commit, and you can see that number I typed out is just here. So for your own machine, you'll need to type that out and see, um, you know, what, what, what is my commit hash? It won't be the same as the one that I have. Um, and you'll need to copy that. Okay. How's everyone getting on? Could you let give me a thumbs up if you've followed this so far? Is there anything that you're not sure about um, that you'd like me to cover in a little bit more detail? Um, Lee, no, it doesn't need to be the first seven numbers. That's just a sort of, you know, you can copy a few digits and it should be okay. Um, I, I usually copy about that and it's fine. If you want, you can copy this whole number and it will still work. Um, so uh, how, did I, how do you go back to the latest version? Is it the same again? Okay, no, uh, it's not quite the same. So I haven't created a commit here. Um, so 
say that I wanted to restore exactly what uh, test.txt was, um, I can just do git checkout test.txt and that will restore it back to, to what it was before I made the change. I think. So if I cat test.txt, no, that didn't work, sorry. <laughs> uh, what am I thinking now? It will be git checkout head test.txt, I think. Okay, yeah. So if I now print it out, you'll see that my age line has reappeared. Um, does that make sense? Can everyone give me a thumbs up if you're following? If you're not sure, give me a thumbs down. <laughs> if there's a, if there's a, if there's a, if there is a thumbs down. Uh, when you checked out the previous version, didn't that become the head? No. So the head is always the commit. So until it's committed, the head hasn't changed. Um, so I'll show you that now. Um, I'll make that same change again. So if I check it out to the previous version, uh, which was that, so I ran git checkout and then the start of that commit hash uh, and then test.txt. Checkout is it's a complicated term in git terms because it means a few different things, but it basically means um, here, it means um, sort of get that version out of the the history and apply it to what I've got right now. Um, so uh, it can mean other things in Git, which I'll go into a little bit later. Um, but in general, it means, yeah, take, take, take the, take the, uh, the this, this version that I'm telling you about. So here, and then test.txt and uh, apply it to what I have. Um, so I'll go back to the bit before where I had it as the previous version. So now if I print out test.txt again, you'll see that that line is missing. Um, if I run git status, you'll see that it shows that the file has been modified. That's because I've removed the line from uh, the file. So if I want to keep the old version again, I should commit it. So I can run git commit dash m revert the change adding my age to the file okay so now my version of the file doesn't have my age in it if i look at the git log um i've got four commits so this is basically create the file add my job to the file add my age to the file and remove my age from the file. Um, I obviously could have done this manually because it's a really simple change. Um, but if your changes are really complicated, you know, you don't really want to be going and deleting lines individually. You just want to be able to take that whole set of changes and um, apply them back on. Um, because files are basically, um, you know, you can change them backwards and forwards one by one. Um, Git often changes the way that people work. So, um, you know, you might previously have found that you write code in one massive long file and that was version one. Um, and then you change that and it, then you have version two. Because you can have multiple files in Git and they can all have their own changes, um, it's, it's much more useful to create more than one file. So, you know, when I wrote my PhD thesis, I wrote chapter one as a file. Uh, and then chapter two as a file, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, they could all be edited independently. Um, and I found that really useful. When it comes to code, um, if you look at projects that people write using Git, you know, their code split across many files. Um, usually that helps you to organize it a bit more. Um, you know, uh, I'm, I was a physicist by background, so um, all of the physics code I wrote, you know, related to energy calculations was in one folder called energy in Git. Um, all the things that were related to time integration were in another folder and, you know, 
but at the end of the day it's still built one program um so it really encourages you to um you know be as organized as you can uh, really you don't need to rely on you know having one single file and that's your master version um and that's really helpful um so the next thing i'm going to talk about very quickly is um something called git ignore so if you are writing uh, code for example um you might find that sometimes uh, files get created that you don't want to store permanently um so you know that could be a data file it could be some output from a simulation you're running that you know you're just testing it out but you don't want to keep it um and so um what it can be cut what can happen is you get these sort of temporary files that you you know you uh, you don't want permanently in your in your git repository um so just to give an example i'm going to create a data file dot dat and we'll assume that the, everything that i create in my repository with the extension dot dat is something that i don't care about they're just um you know things that get generated um but they're never i'm never going to want to ever keep them so i'll just write here is my data file inside it and save that so if i now press Control x and quit if i run git status now what you'll see is that it says untracked file data file like that um that's kind of annoying sometimes you get lots of these data files um and you know i know that i'm never going to care about them um so what we can do is create a file called um git ignore so i will put nano dot git ignore and create a new file here um and this basically uses patterns to try and um, exclude things so what I could do here is put a star. That means, you know, match everything. And then dot DAT. Uh, and that basically says to get anything that is in this folder with an extension of dot DAT, just don't pay attention to it at all. I don't care about that. Um, so if I save that and exit, what you see now, if I run get status, Is that I've got a git ignore file, which I can commit to my repository, but actually that data file that, that doesn't show up anymore. Um, so what I'll do is create my commit for the git ignore file. Um, and I'll commit that. create a git ignore file and add .dat file to that. Uh, if I run status now, you see that it just completely ignores that, that .dat file. Now, uh, the .dat file isn't stored in my repository. We don't care about it. Um, it isn't going to show up any, in any commit. Sometimes, you might want to exclude them generally, but you have one really important data file that you must have there. Um, now, if I try and do git add data file.dat, it tries to complain at me. It says the following paths are ignored by one of your .git ignore files, data file.dat. Hint, use dash f if you really want to add them. Turn this message off if you want. I don't tend to send this message off. Um, so if I run git status, you'll see it hasn't added data file.dat. But if I now run git add dash f data file.dat, what you'll see if I run git status this time is that it's ignored my git ignore file and it's going to add it anyway. So I'm going to commit that file. This time. And save it. So 
how's everyone feeling about this? Does anyone have any questions? Uh, could you give me a thumbs up if it's all okay? Some thumbs up. Is there anything anyone would like me to repeat or go over again uh, or explain in a bit more detail? Oh no, detached head. Okay, this is a, <laughs> a not fun one. So detached head basically means I have checked out previous commit, um, all of the files in that commit, not just you know the one file. Um, and basically it's just to let you look around to a whole previous version of the code. So, um, this is something that I think everybody who ever tries Git gets confused by. Um, I definitely was confused by this. Um, so if I look at my Git log, oh, hang on, I'm in the wrong thing. Uh, type into Git, not into Zoom, Ryan. Uh, so if I type Git log, I've got my full list of commits. If I copy previous uh, commit here and I type instead of so what I previously typed was git checkout and then I put a file the commit hash and then I put a file name so like test.txt for example here I'm not doing that I'm getting rid of the file name when I don't put a file name in there what it means is it checks out all of the files in the repository not just the one that I'm talking about so it goes back to every single file in the repository is checked out to the version that was there on this commit. And now what you see is I get, you are in detached head state. You can look around, make experiments, changes and commit them. And you can discard any commits you make in this state without impacting any branches. What I'm gonna say here is if you see this message, it don't, don't make any commits because it's quite easy to lose commits here. Um, what you should do is have a play around look at the files if you want to look at the history if i look at this right now and do ls.al you'll see that i've got my .git ignore file i've got my test.txt file but that data file that i added in my last commit isn't there if i want to go back to my you know my master copy my latest version i can just to type git checkout head Oh no, I can't, that's not right. Uh, Git checkout master, sorry. Um, master is the branch name. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. Um, don't worry too much about that. Um, master is sort of like a reference here to, if you think about, you know, back in the day when they used to create vinyl records, you used to have your master disk from which all of the other copies were created. It sort of means like that. Um, at the moment, we've sort of got like a linear history of commits. Um, one commit follows after every other one. And master is the the branch. Um, if you think about like a tree, it's like the the root branch that all of the other branches come off of, uh, which we'll discuss a little bit later. But don't worry too much about that. Um, so yeah, if you get into what's called a detached test, head state, just run git checkout master to get back to, to where you, you know, you were originally the, the 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 proper version of the code if you see what i mean um does anyone else have any question okay so so far everything that we've done has been on our computer um we've got a copy locally it's backed up only locally um, which is good in that we've got, you know, multiple versions of the code locally, but it's not so good if, you know, I want to share that code or I want to back it up more permanently so that if my computer gets uh, dropped, you know, or whatever, broken, um, I don't lose anything. So part of the reason that Git became so popular was because of the service GitHub. GitHub is just a website where you can store all of your Git repositories. Um, it, wasn't the first one it's probably not going to be the last one but right now it's probably the most popular so we're going to use that um so what i'll show now is basically how do i 
take my current Git repository that's stored on my computer and put it on GitHub. So I'll bring my browser over here. What we're going to do is go to github.com. Um, I'm already logged in, but um, you should log in if you haven't done that. Um, and what we're going to do is click this little arrow, this little plus button here, and click new repository. So your thing might look slightly different to mine, um, but it should be pretty similar. Um, what we're going to do is just add a name for this repository. So I'm going to put software carpentry, Birmingham, uh, 2021. Um, you can put whatever name you like here. It doesn't have to match the folder name that's on your local computer. Um, it's just got to be a reference in your GitHub account, basically, to identify this um, this particular repository. Oh, I'll put software carpentry dash git dash python. This description again, it's just a description of what the the repository is. So, I'll put example repository for students at software. Carpentry, 19 May 2021. So this bit here about public or private is really up to you. Um, if it's public, anyone can see it. If it's private, only you can see it at the moment, but you can always add other people who will have access to it. So it's pretty common for academics to write private repositories. Um, you know, for Say you're writing a thesis and it's work in progress you don't want everyone to know about that so you'd create a private repository on the other hand um for like good scientific practice it's quite useful to show your code to other people apparently papers that include their code um a link a link to the code that they use to generate the paper is cited more frequently so that's something to consider if you're publishing um but it's really a choice that's up to you um we would encourage people to make things public where possible but uh, you don't have to do that um, generally. So I'll create a public repository here. Um, what you should do is ignore all of these three options. Do not add a readme file, don't add a git ignore, and don't choose the license. Um, and then just click create repository. Okay, has everyone done that? Give me a thumbs up when you've completed it. Okay, a couple of people still doing it, I think. Andre, Anurag, Dina, are you there? Are you stuck with it at some point? Cool. Please let us know if you have any trouble because. Okay, I'll move on. So at the moment, we've basically got an empty repository here. Um, in Git terms, we would call the, the sort of master copy of this that's, you know, stored on a server somewhere, the remote. Um, and we call what we've got on our computer, the local copy. So you'll, you'll often see those terms with Git. Um, so what we need to do is tell our local copy of Git about this version on GitHub, which is going to be our remote copy. So it gives you some handy instructions to copy and paste. Um, we've already created the repository, so we don't need to do that. So what we're doing is pushing an existing repository from the command line. One thing to note here is um, something you don't really need to worry about too much. Just copy and paste this top line. Um, Git used master uh, as its default branch name, but GitHub has changed its default branch name to main. Um, you don't need to worry about that too much. Um, we're just going to copy and paste the top one, and it will still create the default branch name as master on, on GitHub for now. So if I copy and paste that line, this command here, it's saying Git remote 
remote we know already I've just said is the, the version that's going to be somewhere else. Add origin. Uh, that's basically just uh, saying uh, this is our master copy. Don't worry again about that too much. Um, and then here, what you might notice is that mine has git at github.com. Yours might say https forward slash forward slash uh, git at git, github.com. Um, don't worry about that. This is just related to how you um, authenticate yourself with Git. Um, you can either authenticate yourself with a password, which is what it will default to. Um, later on, you can add something called an SSH key. That means you don't always have to keep typing your password out. Um, but for now, just ignore that. Um, whatever it says here, um, just copy and paste that top line. Now, if I press enter, um, what I can now do is basically upload all of my local changes to GitHub. So if I type git push, um, it's like a salt and pepper song from the 80s. Um, you, you push and pull basically to upload and download in Git. Um, so push is to upload and pull is to download. Um, if I type git push, what it asks me to do is um, set the default branch upstream. So it's it's complaining because master doesn't exist on the remote repository. All I need to do is just copy that command that it says there. I only need to do this once. Uh, oh, no, it doesn't like that. You shouldn't have this problem, but uh, I do. Two seconds. Uh, Okay, so going back to that, type git push dash dash set upstream origin master. Uh, and it asks me to sign in with GitHub here. This may not show up for you. I've never seen this before. <laughs> but uh, depending on your operating system, it may just ask you to type your password inside the terminal. I'm going to click sign in with your browser. And hopefully that uh, will work. So what this is basically telling you is it has compressed all my files, uploaded them to the remote copy, and now they're on this Git repository here on the website. So if I go to GitHub again, uh, which is here, and I just refresh the page, what you'll see now is that the files that I created are here. Um, I'll just show you around a few really useful features of this. So. This is my last commit message here. Um, if I click that dot, 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 it shows me the commit hash. Um, if I click this bit here, you can see I've got this like clock and then the number six. That means that I've got six total commits on the repository. If I click this, I can see the list of all of the commits that I've done on here. Um, so uh, that's really useful um, a lot of the time. If I click, for example, these uh, two angle brackets here on added my age to test.txt, what it does is show me the repository at that point in time, all of the repository. So you can see here those those other files, the dot get ignore and the uh, test, the, the this file aren't there. If I go back, um, I can just click this number here, for example, the 4af9dd6. That will just show me the changes that were made on that particular commit. So it's the same as sort of doing git diff on the command line, which I showed you earlier. Um, you can also see there's a handy little thing here that's just copy that commit. That's really there so that you can do um, the, uh, if I, this basically just copies that hash. So if I click that and then do git diff here, I can see the changes. So yeah. For me personally, I find it really useful to go on to GitHub to look at the commits. I find it much more useful than going through the log on the terminal um, because once you've got lots of commits, it's, it's much easier to browse it in the browser, I find. Um, you can do, you can work however you like, really. Um, Claire's asked a good question, which is how long does the upload take? Um, really depends what you've done. So um, 
it will not depend on what the current size of files is in the repository. It's the basically all of the um, the uh, files on the repository. So in your local repository. So say I added a really, really, really big file and then deleted it. Um, that's still going to be in my commit history. Um, so it will basically be the sum total of all of the files across all of the commits um, since you last pushed it. Um, so it's a bit of a look, how long is a piece of string question. If you're just uploading text files, it's going to be really quick. If you're uploading video files, it's going to be really slow. So, um, you know, it, it's limited by your interconnect connection, really. Um, Sally said, how did you find the commits? Um, that's just here, look. So where that little clock icon is in the number six, if I just click that, that takes me to the list of commits here. Okay, so you can see here that it's saying help people interested in this repository understand your project by adding a readme. Um, this is really good advice. You should add a readme. Um, we can do that either on GitHub or we can do it on the command line, but I'll do it on GitHub because just to show you that it's got a text editor built in and it's quite useful. So um, if you name a file readme, um, it will show up basically on the home page. So um, this is written in um, a language called Markdown. Markdown is like a really simple text editing, ed editing um, you know, language. Um, it adds, lets you do things like, you know, add bold, add italics, include images, um, include links. Um, I won't take you too much through it, but basically I can write some text here. This is a readme file written in the markdown language. If I put stars around markdown, um, then you see that uh, it will, I can preview that. And it will be in bold text. If I put single stars instead of double stars, then it will be in italics. Um, so it, it can be a really nice way of making your, you know, when when this public facing, um, it can be a nice way of showing people, you know, the instructions for your code or or for whatever your project is. Um, a really nice thing is that you can do back ticks like this, and then write the name of whatever language you're writing in. Um, and then you can add some code. So I could write some git commands. Um, I'll just write git add barname.txt, git commit um, uh, created barname.txt. Usually people use this for instructions for their projects. Um, as I said, if I scroll down, you can see it as commit new file. And basically I can write exactly the kind of message that I would have written here. All right, create readme md that will default to that title if I don't type anything. Um, add some instructions in markdown format. I can write as the commit message, and then it gives me a chance choice. For now, we'll just click uh, commit directly to the master branch, um, and I'll click commit new file. What we get now is that we've got a new file, but also it shows up here, and it's sort of nice and pretty. If someone comes to my Git repository on GitHub, they can see my instructions. Um, and because I've written that uh, this code snippet here was in Bash, it syntax highlighted it, um, which is nice. Um, okay, I think now is probably a good time to pause. Um, so I'll just give you ten minutes to go and get a cup of tea or anything. Um, before I do do that, has anyone got any questions? Um, if you do, then you can um, you know put them in the chat as well. I'll try and answer them um, quickly. Um, Hi, um, maybe this is something you want to cover at the end or something, but um, uh, it would be good to know. Um, can I create a Git repository in the same way if I'm working? in Blue Bear on the research data store? Yeah, I can show you that now. Um, so if you are, uh, I'll log into Blue Bear. Uh, oh, I'm on VPN. Good question. 
yeah, okay, I, I won't do it on Blue Bear Live, but yeah, it's got Git installed, you can do it exactly the same way. Um, you can do it in RDS. The one thing I would say is if it's really big data, it's probably not good for Git. Um, Git is really for files, 100 megabytes, like, I think GitHub's got a total size limit of something like two gigabytes, unless you pay money for it. Um, we were talking about, about big amounts of research data, it's not really the place to put it. Um, yeah, I'm kind of more thinking about the, the, um, the bash scripts that I'm using to uh, analyze my research data. Yeah, no, that's fine. I would totally put that in Git. I would definitely do it um, <laughs> because it's, it's good to keep a record of it. Also, if you're, are you, I don't know what field you're in, but um, some journals for computational work now will ask for you to submit your submission scripts. Um, so I think um, the Journal of Computational Physics does ask for those. Um, so it's good to keep those backed up um, uh, if you're uh, if you're working in that. It, it obviously varies. If you're in biology, you might not get asked for that, but it's becoming more and more common now for people, for journals to ask for the code that you use to generate your paper. Um, and that includes those scripts. So yeah, I, I would do it. I keep everything in Git basically <laughs> like that. Um, it's really handy. Thank you. I had an issue with the push to GitHub. I got some errors regarding email privacy. Could you copy and paste the error, Sally? Um, I can't answer. I'm familiar with that error message. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, let's break for, for 10 minutes. So we'll come back at uh, quarter to 11. Um, I'll try and help you fix your problem, Sally. <laughs> um, do you want to just share your screen for a second?